like baptizing in swimming pools. I've done that before. We praise the Lord and we're thankful for every opportunity we have to worship the Lord and to uh, not only give to missions but pray for missions and be personally involved in missions uh, in our per in uh, our individual lives as teams and so we want to continue to pray for God's opportunities he may give us to do that very thing in the future and continue to pray for the missionaries that we're lifting up during the uh, Annie Armstrong Easter offering time and the uh, this month that we spend in prayer for North American missions. So uh, continue to do that, and we praise the Lord for every opportunity that we have to do that. It's great to see you tonight. Thank you for coming back. Uh, as Brother Phil said, uh, whether it rains or not, uh, we're uh, in the Lord's house to praise him, to worship him, and grateful for all the things he gives. Uh, tonight we're going to continue in a series of messages from the book of Joshua in the Old Testament. So I want to encourage you to... Uh, find that book once again. This is the third message in the series, and we're uh, in chapter 2 tonight, 24 verses that we're going to look at in chapter 2. And as we look at this story unfold, uh, just to remind you of where we were the last couple of weeks, uh, last week we talked about how Joshua was preparing the people of Israel to go into the land, and he helped to remind them of the covenant that God had made with them long before and also the covenant and the promise they had made to the Lord. And so as they got ready to go in, they pledged to follow Joshua just as they had uh, uh, pledged to follow Moses before him. And also uh, they, the, uh, the three tribes, the uh, tribes of uh, Gad and Reuben and Manasseh, pledged to fight for their brothers who were going across the Jordan River because they had already give, been given their inheritance on the east side of the Jordan. And so they pledged to send their mighty warriors and men of valor uh, into uh, the situation with the rest of their brother tribes to go in and possess the land. Now tonight we're going to look at the action of how God delivers the land or begins delivering the land into the children of Israel's hands and how they're going to possess the land that God gives them. And they, we know that uh, they were uh, sending spies into the land. Two guys went in to check out the land, especially Jericho, Joshua told them to do. And so this is the story tonight of how Israel's amazing deliverance by God giving them the land uh, is so important to us. Because we see not only God's deliverance of the land into their hands, but we see God's deliverance for us way back in the Old Testament here in the book of Joshua. So we're going to read verse number one together in unison, and you uh, should have it on your outline when you came in. You'll see it on these screens, and I want to invite you, if you're able, let's stand together and read this verse. Chapter two, verse number one from Joshua chapter two. So let's say it together. Now Joshua the son of Nun sent out two men from Acacia Grove to spy secretly saying, Go view the land, especially Jericho. So they went and they came to the house of a harlot named Rahab and lodged there. Let's pray. Lord, help us understand even more clearly tonight what it means to see you deliver us. Just as you delivered the land into the hands of of the Israelites, your children, you deliver peace and comfort and joy and power and salvation into our hands every day by what you do in our lives. So we give you praise and thanks for all that you've done, and we pray that you'll give us direction tonight from your word, that it would encourage us, inspire us, and prepare us, not just for this next week, but for every day to live for you. We pray all this believing in Jesus' name and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Please be seated. I had a package that was supposed to be delivered to my house last week. And we're, we've gotten into the real big habit, probably almost all of us, of getting deliveries to our house these days, whether we get it on uh, Amazon or some other company that provides delivery, but I had a package that was supposed to be delivered last week, 
and I got a photo, as you do often, of the package and the little statement that said, it's been delivered. And I said, okay. So I go out to the front porch, there's no package. I go to the side uh, entrance of the house, there's no package. I look all the way around the house, there's no package. I look in the mailbox, there's no package. But yet there is a picture, a photograph of the package. It's got my name on it, it's got, the, got our house address on it, everything's printed on it. And I looked at the photo a little bit more closely, and you know where the, the uh, photo was taken? On the front seat of a FedEx delivery truck. It wasn't on my front porch. It was, in a, in, but it said, it's been delivered, and it's on your front porch. So, of course, you have to wait a little while to finally get in touch with somebody because they want you to wait 24 hours, 48 hours to make sure it doesn't come another time. So I, I call and find out from the company, and the guy that was on the phone with me laughed too because he saw the photo just like I did. I said, it's sitting on the, the front seat of a delivery truck. And he said, yeah, I got that. <laughs> so he, they refunded my money. But the problem with that is that it was an item that I really, really wanted. They promised it to me, but they failed to deliver it. One of the things that we always count on is that is not so with God. If God ever makes a promise to us, he always delivers. And here in this passage in the book of Joshua, he begins his deliverance for his people. Now, we want to remember some things. These folks have been wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. There's a million of them, okay? And now, we know that all the, the men that were 20 years old or older, that uh, when they failed to go into the promised land the first time, all of them are dead, except Joshua and Caleb. They're the only guys that survived the trip that were 20 years old and older. Why? Because they were the two guys that came back and said, God's given us the land. So here they're getting ready to go into the land. Joshua's prepared them to go, and they know one thing. God always delivers. Amen? Amen. Always delivers. And they had that confidence when they went in, and Joshua tells his two guys that he's sending in, his spies to go in the land and say, I want you to go, I want you to see uh, and view the land, and then I want you especially to go to Jericho. So that's what, that was their mission, and they went in to the land. The Bible tells us, as we were reading a few moments ago, that as they went in, it was told the king of Jericho in verse number 2, saying, Behold, men have come here tonight from the children of Israel to search out the country. So the king of Jericho sent to Rahab, saying, Bring out the men who have come to you, who have entered your house, for they have come to search out all the country. <coughs> Excuse me. Then the woman took the two men and hid them. So she said, Yes, the men came to me, but I didn't know where they came from. And it happened as the gate was being shut, that when it was dark, that the men went out, and where the men went, I do not know. Pursue them quickly. For you may overtake them. But she had brought them up to the roof and hidden them with the stalks of flax, which she had laid in order on the roof. Then the men pursued them by the road to the Jordan, to the fords. And as soon as those who pursued them had gone out, they shut the gate. And now before they lay down, she came up to them on the roof and said to the, said to the men, I know that the Lord has given you the land that the terror of you has fallen on us, and that all the inhabitants of the land are faint-hearted because of you. And so we read that first part of the passage, and we see God had already been preparing the people in Jericho for what was about to happen. They were scared to death. In fact, the, later on, in the, as we continue, it says, For we've heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea, for when you came out of Egypt. How many years ago was that? Forty years. But they had heard about it. They knew about it. And what, did, what you did to the kings of the Amorites who were on the other side of the Jordan, Sion and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. And as soon as we heard these things, 
our hearts melted, neither did there remain any more courage in anyone because of you. So we see the stage that said God has already prepared the way because God always delivers. And so he is going to deliver them into their land, give them the possession that he had made a covenant with them about and had always told them about, and they were about to go in and take this land, and the people in Jericho and the people in the land had already been prepared psychologically by God. They were afraid of what was about to happen because they knew that God was the God of miracles. Now, when we see everything unfold here, there's just some statements that are here in this chapter 2 that we need to think about. The first one is, as God always delivers, the people of Jericho had heard of God's power. He had, they had heard of God, they had heard of the, the miracles uh, from Egypt. They had heard of everything God had done in those 40 years as they were wandering in the wilderness. They had especially heard of those two Amorite kings who had been destroyed by the nation because God had given them into their hands. So terror had fallen upon the land. And the Bible says they were faint-hearted. And that's what's in Joshua chapter 2, verses 8 and 9 that we just read together. And before they lay down, she came up to them on the roof and said to the men, I know the Lord's given you the land. Now, <clears throat> that's an amazing statement in itself. Who is Rahab? Rahab is a prostitute. Rahab is a sex worker for the, for the, uh, uh, the town. And, of course, we know about Jericho. We're going to study about it in the next few weeks. Jericho is this giant walled city. And, this giant, and people lived not just in the confines of the city, but they lived also in the wall. And it, it, we see that, that uh, Rahab and her family lived in the wall on the outward part of the wall because we know from the remainder of the story here in chapter 2 that she lets the spies down on a rope down uh, from the top of the wall so they can get out and escape the soldiers that were searching for them. So we know that Rahab would, in our culture today, wouldn't be considered the most reliable source in town, would she? But yet, God uses a person who many people in our culture would look down upon immediately, and he uses her in a way that is going to be a blessing to those two spies and a blessing to his people Israel. And one of the things I think is amazing about uh, Rahab is her belief and her trust in one true God. Because what does she say? She makes a, a, she makes a confession about who God is. We read the scripture again. As soon as we heard these things, verse number 11, our hearts melted, neither did there remain any more courage in anyone because of you. For the Lord your God, he's God in heaven above and on earth beneath. Now what a statement. This is a, a person who was a pagan, who lived within a, a, a pagan culture and society. But yet... God revealed something to her, not just through these two spies, but in everything that she had heard. And because of that, she makes a confession of faith in who the Lord is. So, first of all, we see this statement, the people of Jericho had heard of God's power. They had had the terror fall upon them. They are faint-hearted, it said in verse number uh, in, in uh, verses 8 and 9, and we get to verse number 10, they had heard of the Red Sea crossing, how they defeated the kings on the eastern side. God had already gone before and prepared this psychological way for them to go into the land. But it also affected them in different ways. It affected Rahab in a way of belief and not just in reality and in a fact that they were going to be destroyed. She had a belief in a God who was a miracle working God. And wouldn't it be great if people in our land today had a greater understanding and perception that we have a miracle working God that created all of us? 
I mean, we carry that around at, just for granted, don't we, as Christian believers. God is a God of miracles. He saved all of us. But yet, we have people that walk around us every single day out in our environment in the world, and they don't even, in their mind, know if God exists. Much less would God ever perform miracles. And are the miracles that are talked about in the Old Testament or the miracles of Jesus. I remember in a class in college uh, at Mercer University, uh, we had uh, a Christianity professor, and uh, he was a tremendous guy, had a tremendous faith, member at Ingleside Baptist in Macon, just was a, just a wonderful man. And he, when he taught, he tried to teach everything that people might believe about a certain thing. I remember one day, he was talking about the miracles of Jesus in one of the New Testament classes we had. And as he was speaking about it, he said, now, uh, he, he would describe views, theological views. And some theologians thought this, and some theologians thought this about the miracles of Jesus. And then he presented one presentation from a guy that didn't believe the miracles happened. And I saw one little boy from South Georgia, and I thought he was going to explode on the back, uh, the back desk back there. And I just wanted to tell him, son, he didn't say he believed that. He said some people believe that. And that's where we have to understand some people in our world do believe that, but there are so many that don't have any belief whatsoever. And so how do we share with them the good news of Christ and the miraculous powers of the Lord. Well, I, we have to tell the stories of the scripture. We have to tell the stories of what God did in the past, but also what God's done in us. In such a way that we reveal to people that we have God who always delivers, and he is the God of all power and miracles. Here, Rahab heard this story long before the Israelites ever showed up. And we have an opportunity every day to be revealing the story of Jesus and the power of his miraculous ways, the power of our God that delivers us every day. And that we can always count that he delivers in his promises and his covenant that he makes with us. So this first statement about uh, what God, the Lord's the God of heaven above and earth beneath, we can count on that, that that was a revelation given to Rahab, and she shared that uh, with these two spies. And so we recognize that Rahab, in who she was, even though she would not have been looked upon in her culture or ours as a special individual that was knowledgeable or a leader or especially a spiritual leader, yet she is the one who experienced in that moment that God truly is the God of miracle working power. And she makes that confession about it. It goes on the scripture, that second point is exactly what I just said. The Lord's the God of heaven above and on earth beneath. Uh, Rahab's confession about the Lord. And then she goes on in verse number 12 and 13. It says, now therefore I beg you, Swear to me by the Lord, since I have shown you kindness, that you will also show, show kindness to my father's house, and give me a true token, and spare my father and my mother and my brothers and sisters and all uh, that they have, and deliver our lives from death. So the men answered her, Our lives for yours. If none of you tell this business of ours, and it shall be when the Lord has given us the land that we will deal kindly and truly with you. So she confesses her belief in the God of all power and all miracles. And then she asks, can we be saved? Can we be delivered from the destruction that's about to happen? She understood her part in the deliverance. She understood that if she could save the spies' lives, and if she could make her confession before the Lord, could they promise that she would be delivered? And of course, they make this oath with her. She makes an oath to them, and they make an oath to her. And she let them down by a rope through the window, for her house was on the city wall. This is verse 15. 
and she dwelt on the, on the wall. And she said to them, get to the mountain, lest the pursuers meet you. Hide there three days until the pursuers have returned, and afterward you may go your way. So the men said to her, we will be blameless of this oath of yours, which you've made us swear, unless when we come into the land you bind this line of scarlet cord in the window through which you let us down. And, and unless you bring your father, your mother, your brothers, and all your father's household, to your own home. So it shall be that whoever goes outside the doors of your house into the street, his blood shall be on his own head, and we will be guiltless. And whoever is with you in the house, his blood shall be on our head if a hand is laid on him. And if you tell this business of ours, then we will be free from your oath which you have made us swear. Then she said, according to your words, so be it. And she sent them away, and they departed, and she bound the scarlet cord in the window. God always delivers, and as he delivers, he uses Rahab in a special way to be part of his deliverance. Rahab asked that her family might be spared, and as she does, the promises are made. I want to encourage us about something when we recognize uh, the, the power of the Lord to work in a person's life like Rahab's life just like he does in our life. That when he does, then we are those people that deal kindly with one another and kindly with people in the world. Rahab understood in some limited way her part in keeping these two spies safe. And she asked to be dealt kindly with and to be honored. And one of the amazing things was that God honored her request in a, in a powerful way. Uh, first, the people of Jericho heard of God's power. Then the, the recognition is there that the Lord is the God of heaven above and on earth beneath by Rahab. And then finally, the spies... Give their promise. We will deal kindly and truly with you. You know, that's an admonition and encouragement to us that we would be those people that cared enough about folks around us to be kind not only to one another in the body of Christ, but to be kind to those folks out in the world that so desperately need Jesus. Amen. To have a kind-hearted spirit and recognize God may be working in their hearts and in their minds, and he may even use us to do it. And we may have the direction from the Lord to care for people in the world that we don't even know yet. But we ought to have that kind of passion within us and also that kind of awareness around us. That we have a God who's working through us to care for others and to deliver others just as he's delivered us. The Lord watched over the spies as they listened to Rahab's God-honoring instructions. Do you think Rahab just came up with, uh, with uh, now I want you to go to the mountains and stay there for three days, and then the pursuers will come? Listen, God showed her that. Or she wouldn't have had instructions to give to the spies. But God revealed to her how to care for them. And she shared that with the, the two men. And then they were able to recognize God's power working through this lady. And so in every way, God calls us to, to deal kindly with each other. We read in the book of Romans Chapter 12, verse number 10. This is, uh, this is the encouragement and teaching for the church. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love in honor giving preference to one another. Well, this is a, a admonition for us to treat each other the right way, but it's also an encouragement to treat people in the world the right way. Even if you don't know them. Even if you don't have a relationship with them. Even if they just serve you in some way in the world. What keeps us from God's people 
of being the kind of servants that care and love and are kindly affectionate to one another. I've told you a hundred times, I get really, really discouraged when I'm driving in the car and people don't drive the way they ought to. <laughs> and many times I'm really just on the edge. I've lived in Atlanta for a long time, so I'm on the edge of blowing the horn all the time. And I just have to pull myself back. And I have to remember something that Brother Matthew over here reminds me of. I got a fish on the back of my car. I've got a, a reminding people that I'm a believer. Uh, I, I may have uh, other kind of symbols. I, and, and I forget that sometimes. I forget that I might have a cross on my car or an ichthus fish on my car representing that I'm a Christian believer. And yet, I have to remember being kindly affectionate to people that don't drive the way they should on the road. We need to be kindly affectionate to people that might even treat us in an ugly way when we're out in the world, whether we're in a store or whatever it is. What keeps us from disarming them emotionally by just being kind and caring? I look at this lady, Rahab. And, and I think as God calls us to deal kindly with each other and with those he puts in our path in the world who may have the potential to be Christian believers, do you know something? It's amazing how God worked in the children of Israel's life to get them ready to go into the land and also in Rahab's life. He saved Rahab's household and she became a part of God's people. Did you know that? Did you know that Rahab is an ancestor of the Lord Jesus Christ? Did you realize that when we get over into Matthew chapter 1, verses 5 and 6, the Bible tells us about the lineage of Jesus, and this is part of the lineage that Salmon uh, begot Boaz by Rahab, and Boaz begot Obed by Ruth, and Obed begot Jesse, and Jesse begot David the king. Rahab the sex worker in Jericho is radically saved and protected by the power of God in his miraculous way. She is grafted into the people of God, protected as Israelites come in to take Jericho. And Rahab becomes a part of the lineage of Jesus. Amen. Only God can do that. And God always delivers in such a way that is amazing, miraculous, that we can see his power always displayed before us. So we recognize that when these men returned, they departed and went to the mountain. They did exactly what Rahab told them to do in the God-honoring instructions that he gave her. They departed and went to the mountain. They stayed there three days until the pursuers returned. This is verse 22. And the pursuers sought them all along the way, but did not find them. So the two men returned, descended from the mountain, and crossed over, and, and came to Joshua the son of Nun, and told him all that had befallen them. Now read verse 24 carefully. And they said to Joshua, Truly the Lord has delivered all the land into our hands, for indeed all the inhabitants of the country are faint-hearted because of us. You know, we think many times, even as believers, we get in our world and we think we're the only ones that's got a challenge, the only ones that have a problem, the only ones that, it, that are, are suffering disappointment and discouragement and, and, you know, all the things that the world throws our way. But what is so important is to realize God already knows what we need. He already knows, as we've said a thousand times, what's going to happen next. He already knows who's going to come into our past. He already knows that no matter what we face or how desperate our lives might seem right now, He is always going to assure us that he is going to still be the Lord of miracles and still be the one who delivers his people. Amen. God always delivers. 
And Jesus is our prime example of our deliverance, right? He is Deliverer, capital D. He is our Deliverer for every day, and we can count on Him at all times. And I love when the Old Testament reassures us and reconnects us to our Deliverer in every single way. Every book in the Bible, from Genesis all the way through the Revelation, shows us a picture of Messiah Jesus, every single one. And you can see him as the deliverer and the God who never fails. God didn't fail the Israelites because he prepared them to go in and take the land. And they had confidence. The two spies could come back and tell Joshua, we have confidence because God has already gone before us and shown the people that we're going to come in and take the land. They had a, a, an amazing uh, adventure that only God could protect them. Only God could bring them home safely. Only God could have put Rahab at the right moment, the right time, in the right circumstance with the right instructions to make it all happen. We have God who always delivers. Amen. Father, thank you for blessing us and for the power of your word always. We thank you that how you've connected everything together for us that we can see our own need for deliverance and how you always deliver in our lives every day. Thank you, Lord, for your power and your grace. Thank you for the way you led Joshua and the people of Israel back into the land. Thank you, Lord, for the amazing way that you saved Rahab who uh, might have never even been considered an important person ever in her life, but then in a moment of confessing who you are and listening to your spirit, she guided your people to do the thing that you had called them to do. So we thank you that she's in the lineage of Jesus. We thank you that we'll see her in heaven one day and we can talk to her about the amazing way God revealed himself to her in that moment. Lord, help us be aware that when you reveal yourself to us, that we'll be ready to act. We'll be ready to be kindly affectionate to one another and to the people in the world who need you so desperately. We love you tonight, Lord. Thank you for being the God who always delivers. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.